Legacy Sabbath School. This is what they, April 29. Why do we ask that? It's for the tape. So that when we're looking around in videos and we wonder when this was, we'll have it right there, April 29. What you're doing In May, there will be a conference on free will here on this campus, and it's been prompted by recent developments in neuroscience, and Jim Walters is putting it together. A number of people are coming from around the country, and I'm giving one of the papers, and I'm going to share with you some of the things that will be in that paper for that conference. So that's our agenda for today, um, and I think we'll have fun. Let's begin with this. We God, thank you for this class. Thank you for Roy, who started it, and we seek to continue his legacy here. I pray for your presence. Rather, I pray for my awareness of your presence, and all of our awareness of your presence, that we might uh, discern ways to move forward in Christ's name. Okay, so we're going to look at three current theories of human free will, but in order to establish where we are historically, we need to go all the way back to René Descartes and his famous distinction between thinking substance and extended substance. This will come to you in a handout in a little bit. So. Uh, but my wife, thankfully, is doing that for me because we got caught in traffic, but we're here. So, René Descartes distinguished between thinking substance and extended substance, or what we might call mind and matter. And that's the beginning of modern philosophy. Why? Because Descartes threw away all authorities and he wanted to move forward on reason alone. That marks the transition from pre-modern to modern philosophy. That's why René Descartes is thought to be the father of modern philosophy. But when he distinguished between thinking substance and extended substance, which we will call mind and matter, he set things up in a way that's been difficult ever since. And one way to read the history of Western thought, one way is to think of how different schools of thought have tried to relate to the problem once Descartes caused it by separating things so severely. So one, one uh, school of thought took his mind side of it, the mental substance side of it, and kept going and is alive and well today. And these are the various forms of idealism. And there are many, many different forms. This one line suggests that there's one school of idealism. Actually, there are many. And they uh, have their debates amongst themselves. Then on the other hand, there are the materialisms, eventually became called the physicalism. I think people didn't want to call themselves materialists. I think they didn't want to say, I am a materialist, because that word came to have some negative connotation. So physicalism is what it tends to be called now. And you have a whole number of, of theories moving in this direction. Meanwhile, however, dualism, or what we might call substance dualism, has gone in and out of favor, but I would say that it's on a resurgence now. One might have thought that substance dualism had been forever uh, eliminated, but actually there are people who are writing very substantive, <laughs> very good books on substance dualism that we need to take into account. J.P. Moreland, uh, I think he's done a bio, where is uh, Dr. Branson, is that where he is? Yes, he is. He's professor of philosophy and other things. Yes. So he's written a great book defending substance dualism. So far from thinking that this is a thing of the past, we need to be aware of it, and we need to understand that people would not have stuck with this for generations if it, not, if it did not have some merit. So that's, that's where we are. Uh, we have all these, through these years, been struggling with these three uh, schools of thought, each of which has its own variation. And I begin my paper by saying, uh, Alfred North Whitehead simply will not play this game by this rule, these rules. Once 
one way to understand a process thought is to say, try to get way behind uh, Descartes and start things all over again. And that's what one has here, uh, sort of symb symbolically depicted, because instead of separating things like this with big spaces between them, organic realism, also called process thought, has tried to pull things back together as they perhaps were before Descartes. So um, here, instead of mind and matter, mind being up here and matter being down here in some kind of dualism, um, and notice also, I think it's symbolically significant that these are squares, right? <laughs> in a vertical fashion, little harsh substances. And then over here, you have more of a circular and comfortable occasion of experience. This is what he would say is one event in our lives. Uh, but the matter part of it becomes the physical pole of the experience. And then that same event has a mental pole as well. So as where Descartes split mind and matter, what process philosophy is trying to do is to put them back together again and make two uh, very, very important differences. One, to overcome the dualism that one has from Descartes on down. And the other is to get rid of substance thinking, or thinking that the most uh, fundamental things of the earth, uh, of, of the universe, are unchanging uh, actualities. What we want instead in process thought is to say, no, we don't have substances at the bottom of things. We have events. We have uh, occurrences. Uh, and so we move from those substances to these events. We also move from a sort of um, harsh division between mind and matter and try to put them together. And I think it's interesting that this, this is sort of moving that way, and this is sort of stuck back here. Uh, and that's pretty much been the way it has been for quite some time. Now, if I can get something else up, I'll put uh, this. A lot of you have seen this already. This is a, a blown up version of one moment. So now we're actually talking about not 60 seconds or not even a portion of that. Life is made up of a whole series of singular moments. They're not even tied together like pearls on a string. This, because the string suggests too much continuity. I think a better analogy would be uh, train cars, where they're linked together from one event to the other event. But this is just one event hugely blown up. And here are the uh, handouts. Thank you to Mrs. Larson. So what you have in these handouts is exactly what's on the screen. So this is one occasion of experience. William James called these drops of experience. One moment, one um, event, and this is a blown up version. Billions of times, right? This is, this is really magnified hugely just for us to get uh, some understanding of what's going on. Also, this has no technical language on it. And I think it's fair to say that the process people uh, sort of form a club of their own sometimes because they use their own language. And the, the a reason why they do that is the current language is so permeated with presuppositions that they don't want to accept that they have to coin new language to express this new point of view. But that new language makes it more difficult for other people to understand. So what I've done here is put what I think is the composition of an actual occasion into ordinary language. Uh, and that suggests, and I put this on the board a few weeks ago, that suggests, let me back up. Many, many books on this subject are written from subatomic particles up to human consciousness. And Whitehead just said, Alfred North Whitehead said, that's the wrong way to begin. We ought to begin with what we know best, which is our own experience, and try to clarify what we ourselves are experiencing, 
then connect that with the idea that there is no dualism. So whatever happens from here on down in the scale of life has to be matters of quantity, not quality. So there are degrees of consciousness. There are degrees of freedom. There are degrees of awareness and so forth. And Whitehead, per hypothesis, would say it goes all the way down to whatever there at the very bottom. That does not mean that quarks can feel, but it does mean something like this. Uh, the, the Quakers say that there is that of God in each of us, right? And at the bottom of things, process theologians, those who begin and believe in organic uh, realism and so forth, they would say there is that of freedom at the base of things. There is that of self-determination at the base of things. And therefore, we don't ask the question, where in the evolution or the going up of the scales of life does consciousness, freedom, and awareness first appear, right? Let's say from the amoeba on up to us, where does consciousness, where does awareness first appear? No. Well, Whitehead would say, we reason the other way. We start with us, and we ask how far down it goes before we have to stop. And Whitehead would say, we never stop. We don't know whatever's down there, but we just keep going all the way down. A person like Philip Clayton will say, well, let's stop at, at one cell organism. But the idea is, no matter where one stops, one begins with one's own experience, tries to clarify that as well as one can, and then reason downward from the scale of life, on the scale of life, and per hypothesis, one might say, uh, for the sake of the discussion, one uh, suggests that. This is called panpsychism sometimes, or uh, a lot of people like the word pan-experientialism sometimes. That doesn't mean that the leaves can uh, talk to us or anything like that, or pray or something like that. No, it means that there is that which is of freedom all the way down. There is that which is of awareness all the way down, and there are no qualitative distinctions. Uh, this is different, say, from what uh, our colleague and mentor Jack Provencia thought. He thought the scale of life went up and up and up, but then there was a qualitative difference between organisms that have uh, freedom and organisms that don't have freedom, and from a process point of view, that's not the way things are, but rather up and down the scale of life, organisms have more or less freedom, a quantitative, not qualitative change. So, we have the past just flowing into that moment of occasion. And if this were the only thing going on, the determinants would be wholly right. The next moment in this process would be simply a repetition of the moment that has occurred. So there is, we don't have absolute freedom. Whatever freedom we have is constrained by the actual past that we have. The past, of course, eventually fans out to include the whole history of the whole universe, but one's own slice of it is going to be quite uh, restricted. So growing up where I did, I did not have all the same opportunities that a lot of you did and vice versa. So my past is different. Someone who has never heard of Jesus Christ doesn't have Jesus Christ in his or her past and cannot make a decision for or against Jesus Christ. So what, what's in one's past already sets up a constraint on the width or the breadth of, or the number of free choices we will have subsequent to the event. But we notice, as we think about ourselves, no, just think about your own experience. We notice that sometimes the next, the next occasion is different. Um, and people like Whitehead and people like that say, that's because there is the God's presence here, or God's intervention, or and that's not the right word, God's participation. And God's role in all of this is in large measure, there are other things too, but in large measure, God's role in all this is to give to us new possibilities. If we are not sensitive to the presence of God in our lives, we are, we are going to keep on doing the same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing. And one is around people like that sometimes. They have no new thoughts ever. It's just repetition, repetition. 
And uh, Whitehead's thought is that you know, great breakthroughs in science and art and liter literature and religion are all opportunities when this divine lure, whether people know it as God or not, opens up options that otherwise would not have been possible. So God is not the source of unfreedom. God is the source of freedom. If it were not for God, we wouldn't have any freedom. Now, if it weren't for God, none of this would be here. But the point is that the divine participation in every moment of every life, uh, we've said it sometimes, God is working for good in every moment of every life. That's what makes our lives more free. Now, we have New Testament scholars here, I think, because they will talk about, Jesus talks about being the source of freedom, right? Paul talks about if one is free, one ought not to return to situations of unfreedom. And sometimes we wonder, how could it be that living a more Christian life, as Jesus thought or Paul thought, make us uh, more free rather than less? Because some people have the idea that to be a disciple of Jesus, that one will have less options than one previously did. This is the contrary thought. If it weren't for uh, the presence of God in Jesus Christ and in other ways, working throughout every moment of every life for good, there would be simple repetition of what's going on. Now, Whitehead was a clear uh, evolutionist, and he lost faith in God as a young person and worked with Bertrand Russell. But as he thought about evolution, he said, if there were not some uh, presence providing new possibilities, evolution would just keep going straight. There would be no progress at all, or entropy would take over. So for purely intellectual and cosmological reasons, he introduced gradually over time more and more uh, the notion of God. First of all, God is <laughs> uh, uh, caused by Whitehead to be called the principle of limitation. And at the end, he's called the poet of the universe. Right. So it, it goes on. The ones whose suffering is um, more intense than our own. And Whitehead said there's a second idolatry. And that occurs when the first idolatry occurs when we worship something as God, even though it isn't God. The second idolatry occurs when we give God the characteristics of Caesar Augustus. That's the second idolatry. And one has to wonder if Whitehead wasn't right when he said a lot of people in our time may not be idolaters in the first sense, but many are <coughs> idolaters in the second sense character of God for them is the character of a Roman ruler. Okay, so that's the, that's the, um, now let me go back to the other chart if I can. Let me say something right here. You'll read every so often, like in the Atlantic, someone breathlessly announcing we've just discovered we don't have free will. <laughs> That's really interesting. It is. We all know that we have free will. That's not the question. The question is how does that occur? How do we know we have free will? Think about your own life introspectively. You know there are times when you made choices that you did not have to make. You know that. And when you look at the lives of other people, you can see that they made choices that they did not have to make. Also, to pull back just a step, we know that the persons we are, the characters we have, are not merely inherited by us, but they are in part formed by our own free decisions. So who I am today is partly established by who I was yesterday and the choices I made. So both the choices I see and the choices I observe and the person I am and the person I could have been are all in part established on freedom. So just, just look around. Secondly, and our article gets to that point, 
at the end of the article by in the Atlantic, uh, after going through all this evidence, right, all this evidence, the man said, well, we probably have to believe in free will anyway, and he starts listing experiments that show that people who don't believe in free will act less responsibly than those who do. And he has some empirical evidence to suggest that that is so. <clears throat> the other thing, though, is that, let's think about it. The, our whole society, and every society, is premised on the idea that we are answerable for the choices we make, and we are answerable in part for the people we become. No institution that holds our society together is possible without that premise. Schools, courts, parenting, all of these, uh, intellectual discourse, all uh, imply that we are, uh, in fact, capable of making some choices about our own decisions and some choices about the person we will become. So really, really, really. Now, what do we have here? And I mean no offense to anybody. But here we have a few neuroscientists <coughs> sitting in their offices asking people to see how fast they are aware that they've pressed red buttons on the table. And then when they get the notion that people push red buttons before they are aware of them, they, like I say, breathlessly, breathlessly announce to the whole world that freedom doesn't exist. Well, those of us who believe in freedom, as do you, we're basing our conclusions not on a few neuroscientists push, pushing some red buttons. We're basing our conclusions on what billions of people over thousands of years in many societies have confirmed for themselves. And I think it's possible to say to someone, you know, if you don't believe in free choice, run a society on your premise for 100 years. And let's, then let's talk. So now, a lot of scholarly interest appropriately occurs in response to how this develops and how we can exercise it more freely. But to say that we don't have free will of any sort is just plain sophistry. The person who says that presupposes that we have the opportunity to believe or not believe him or her. So even, even discourse of the sort that I'm having now with you makes no sense unless we believe that you have some capacity to take it in or leave it out. So the whole, the whole, of, the whole of life is uh, presupposed on that. Now, Immanuel Kant said that kind of knowledge is as good as induction deduction. If one has to presuppose things in order to do what one is doing, that is true enough for our purposes. Example. A scientist has to presuppose that the objective world is not an illusion. Otherwise, the scientist can't do his or her work. The scientist also has to uh, be confident that there's enough linkage between cause and effect that over time, scientists can discern it. If one doesn't presuppose that, the scientific enterprise is not possible. Now, it is possible <coughs> in some, you know, it is conceivable, not possible, it is conceivable that the universe didn't exist 60 seconds ago. Believing that we don't have free will is about as plausible as that. So let's look at the theories about how we have it, not whether we have it. And people like this begin right where I've said. And people, if you look at all of this, here people didn't really believe that we had no choice whatsoever. These are different ways of accounting for what we know to be true. Okay. <coughs> Non-reductive physicalism, as seen in Nancy Murphy's writings, uh, move away from materialism just a little bit in her idea that patterns that have levels of organization that are greater than uh, inferior or below levels, under levels, uh, primary levels, they have a kind of push down exertion over things. And I, I always try to come up with some illustration that makes this clear to myself, and if it's clear to me, then maybe it will be clear to others. But think, think of a pile of automobile parts in your garage, just a heap of them, just a heap of them. You can't drive that. It's not until someone organize that, organizes that in a very structured and complex system does one have something one can drive. That's what's called cause uh, down of uh, 
non-reductive causation. Something imposes order and integration on that raw data such that we move to a higher level of actuality and we have a different thing. An automobile is not merely a pile of parts. An automobile is a pile of parts integrated and systemized in a certain way. The analogy breaks down here because uh, we know that automobile parts come together because human beings make them happen, but in non-reductive physicalism, that happens in nature of its own accord. So there is no uh, analogy to us putting the car together. It's as though the parts of the car are in the garage and over time they gradually work themselves into be an automobile. How does that happen? Well, we don't know. <laughs> and I read and read Nancy Murphy and I want to know, how does that happen? Well, all she will say is that we cannot reduce an automobile all the way down. If we go too far down, it's going to be a pile of parts. It will not be an automobile any longer. And, you know, all of that sounds straightforward enough. Her, her way of putting it is that the brain um, causes the mind to have some experiences, but the mind causes the brain to have some experiences. Um, but she says that's so obvious. You know that changes in your body cause changes in your thinking. You know that. You also know that changes in your thinking cause changes in your body. And that's what downward causation means. It means you can think your way into different bodily states. Now, they keep talking about mind and matter as though they were things. And I just really uh, am hesitant about that. I think the word mind is a verb and not a noun. Mind your manners. Mind your own business. Mind the gap if you're in the tube at, in London. <clears throat> of these, the mind is to the brain what hearing is to the ear, or what smelling is to the nose, or what tasting is to the mouth. Now, I'm just using very, very rudimentary analogies, but you don't ask, where is the hearing? That's, that's kind of a mis understanding of what's going on. The mind, minding, uh, is not a substance, it's a function, it's an activity. So I, I remember once we had our anatomy lab open to some students of philosophy from another school, and they went through the anatomy <laughs> lab, and then they said, well, where is, where is the soul? I've been looking at the cadavers, where is the soul? Well, the soul is the brain at work. The soul is not another substance. It's the brain at work. So minding is the way. We should just get rid of that word mind as a noun because it is uh, so, so misleading. We can use it as a gerund, but not, not as a noun in, in these circumstances. So I think that even Nancy Murphy is sort of stuck in that kind of substance thinking uh, and therefore not able to make too much progress. Okay. Emergent monism is the sort of thing one would find in the writings of Philip Clayton. And I have really tried to understand the difference between non-reductive physicalism and emergent no monism. And it is this, two things. One, uh, emergent monism is dynamic and evolutionary. Philip Clayton says, we cannot account for these increases in uh, higher levels unless we take into account that these are different chapters in the story of evolution. So he puts to it an evolutionary cast. One rarely hears Nancy Murphy talking about uh, evolution in her discussions of non-reductive physicalism. I don't think it's because she cares one way or the other about it. It's just not on the horizon for her. But Philip Clayton makes that front and center. And he believes that we cannot uh, understand higher levels in the scale of life unless we understand that they are later uh, stages in the state of life too. The other thing is that uh, emergent monism thinks of these scales, levels of life, at the top level. There may be another level beyond where we now are. And uh, Philip Clayton really keeps that possibility open. Maybe we will, in the future, evolve, he says, into 
cure a mental AIDS. That's a possibility. And uh, Nancy Murphy doesn't think in those terms. If there is a heaven, Philip Clayton thinks there is, uh, then that can be populated by non-physical beings, whereas for Nancy Murphy, Murphy, it cannot be populated by non-physical beings. Okay, now I have some quotations from each of these here that um, we can look at very quickly. Where it says three current theories of free will. So we have Nancy Murphy first, non-reductive phys uh, physicalism. We criticize overly simple accounts of the causal processes and make our case for the necessity of considering downward causation, the effect of the whole on its parts, as well as bottom-up causation, the effect of the parts on the whole. So it's a two-way street. The concept of downward causation, while commonly employed in the sciences, is highly suspect among some philosophers. On our account, downward causation involves selection or constraint of lower level processes on the basis of how those lower level processes or entities fit into a broader, higher level causal system. Entities, that's too bad to do that with events with it. That Continence in downward causation is not equivalent to denying all causal determination. The lower level variants may be produced either uh, deterministically or randomly. Okay, so another way to think of this is in contrast to the doctrine of epiphenomenalism. That's a word that's used for the idea that all of our um, mental activity is a flow up from our brain activity. And uh, what Nancy uh, Murphy and others are saying, well, no, uh, our mental act activities is sometimes a matter of a flow down. Our minds sometimes do affect our, our brains and so forth and so on. No, she says this is so commonplace, I don't know why I have to say it, except that a lot of people doubt it, so we have to better say it. Uh, okay, here is um, Philip Clayton's view. And you see the notion, you see the emphasis on evolution here. Emergence is the view that new and unpredictable phenomena are naturally produced by interactions in nature. Naturally produced. That car comes together on its own. That these new structures, organisms, and ideas are not reducible to the subsystems on which they depend. If you take all the pieces of the, of the car apart, you don't have any. And that the newly evolved realities in turn exercise uh, a causal influence on the parts out of which they arose. The emergence theory suggests that the consciousness, or what we call mind, is derived from and is dependent upon complex biological systems. But consciousness is not the only emergent level. In one sense, it is merely another in a very long series of steps that have characterized the evolutionary process. So you see, uh, if we are going to go up the scale of life, Phil, uh, Clay Filton wants us to consider this uh, in an evolutionary way. I'm pausing because my mind wandered. Um, you know, Philip Clayton became a philosopher and theologian of great note, first at the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Santa Rosa. He did not come from a Christian family. He had a teenage conversion to Jesus Christ, and he studied the Bible with the pastor of the Church of Santa Rosa. And I once said to him, you know, the reason why you're not a Seventh-day Adventist today is you could never pass the test on the 2300 days. He said, that's right. <laughs> you can see what happens, you know, when we are doing our little work in churches and so forth, we may not think it matters much, but it, it actually can matter a great deal. Okay. So next paragraph from Philip Clayton. Neither dualism nor reductive uh, physicalism, I should say, not dualism. Neither dualism nor reductive physicalism, be sure to change that word, then, tells a complete story. Drawing the arguments from both philosophy and contemporary science, I will defend the thesis that mind positively efficacious mental properties, properties emerges from the natural world as a further step in the evolutionary process. I would rather say minding does that, not mind. The naturalists of mind or minding, but also its uh, 
specific differences becomes evident only when one looks at how biological evolution works and what it produces. So, non-reductive physicalism is not good enough, Clayton says, because it doesn't take into account the dynamic movement of the evolutionary story. Okay, then we come to process thought, and this is from the Center for Process Studies at Claremont, their uh, web page, and this is describing that attempt to pull all this together. Process metaphysics, in general, seeks to elucidate the developmental nature of reality, emphasizing becoming rather than static existence or being. It also stress stresses the interrelatedness of all entities. Process describes reality as ultimately made up of experiential events rather than enduring inner substances. The particular character of every event, event and consequently the world, is the result of a selective process where the relevant past is creatively brought together to become that new event. Reality is conceived as a process of creative advance in which many <coughs> past events are integrated in the events of the present and in turn uh, taken up by future events. The universe proceeds as, this is from Whitehead, the many become one and are increased by one in a sequence of integrations at every level and moment of existence. Process thought thus replaces the traditional Western substance metaphysic with an event metaphysic. Terms that <coughs> further characterize process thought are interrelatedness, unity and diversity, non-dualism, panentheism, mutual transformation, person and community, and pan-experientialism. So those are the three, and they move progressively away from the materialisms that seem so dominant from here. I remember the first time I met Dr. Small. Anybody remember Dr. Small? I met him at a dentist at school and he came up to me and he said, my name is Dr. Small and I am a rank I am a rank materialist. I often wonder what he meant by that. Minimally, he did not accept dualism. Now, one of the things I'm going to point out in my paper, I'm going to talk about what I call axiomatic anxiety. What is that? If one looks at the history of the discussion, it's been going on for a long, long time with absolute progress. This is so that it's commonplace for people to begin their paper through presentation by saying, this is a topic on which there has been no progress for about 500 years. Now why is it? It's not because the evidence is not there. One side will present evidence that it finds convincing, and the other side always says, yes, but. Then the other side presents its evidence, and the other side says, yes, but. And that goes on for generations after generations. Something other than the, the evidence and the modes of reasoning is going on here. And I think it becomes pretty obvious when we look at the literature. If one looks at why so many scientists just hang on to determinism, and it's in the Atlantic Arth 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 article of uh, May of 2016, you can look it up if you want. Actually, I have it here in the handout. Uh, right off the bat, they will say the scientific method depends upon a strict correlation between cause and effect, such that everything that's in the effect should be in the cause. And we are very anxious about the continuation of the scientific method, and they should be. Think of how many people deny climate change now. The scientific method is under pressure, not merely from religious fundamentalists, but from secular postmodern. The scientific method is vulnerable, and that, I think, the axiomatic anxiety, the anxiety about fundamental principles that will not let the scientists very easily abandon de ter uh, determinism. That's the real commitment. I'm just convinced of it. On the other hand, people who believe in freedom, sometimes called libertarian freedom, the kind of freedom you and I are talking about, have a deep, deep anxiety too, and that is if we concede that people are 
very much determined that we will lose our sense of being responsible, and by that I mean answerable and not merely attributable, attributable. and we will lose our capacity to be answerable uh, and society will be in peril. Now, I think we need to talk about those what I call axiomatic anxiety below this debate because I think those axiomatic anxieties are what keep are what keeping uh, any kind of progress being made. Until we address them, uh, we'll be talking. If time should last this long, much longer as we know it, if time should last this much longer as we know it. Oh, we'll be discussing this 500 years from now without having made any progress. We need to address that axiomatic anxiety, uh, otherwise um, progress is impossible. Can you imagine what it feels like to be a scientist and think that the scientific method is under attack, directly or indirectly? That's a very serious thing. What must it feel to an ethicist like me to think that moral responsibility, the idea that we are all answerable for how we use the measure of freedom we have, if that premise, that axiom, that presupposition, that postulate, whatever word you want to use, if that becomes less and less a matter of taken for granted conviction in a society, that society is going to fall apart. And the empirical evidence is listed in your article in The Atlantic, where they do a number of experiments and they tell one group to do something under the premise that you have free will, and they tell, do another group to do the same thing under the premise that they don't have free will, and the ones who don't have free will consistently act less responsibly. So we're not talking about something um, hypothetical. It's true. Now, any, here's, any axiom that is so important that the whole of society and all of its institutions depend upon it, it's true enough. We never have absolute certainty in this life about anything, but that's true enough. Any axiom that keeps alive the scientific method that has made all of our lives so much better, has made the lives of ordinary people, like most of us in this room, Science has made the lives of ordinary people so much better than it was for several generations back. Anything that puts that method at risk, anything that makes it vulnerable, is a very, very, very serious thing. And I think we ought to think about that. We ought to be careful about diminishing our senses of moral accountability. We ought to be careful about being dismissive of the scientific method. A whole lot depends on Okay, uh, you can read the Atlantic article for, article for yourself when you, when you want to. First comment or question? I think that um, within the scientific sphere, there is an increasing number of people who believe that some things are outside the realm of scientific method. Mm -hmm. So if you were to ask Francis Cullen, the head of NIH, um, he would certainly accept that some things, and there are lots of fields in which they say, well, religion really come outside the range, and these are appropriate considerations, but they're not subject to the scientific method. I guess the scientific method depends a lot on repetition, and if one has something that happens once, the scientific method is less able to handle that kind of thing. I think that that's right. I also think, though, that there are other mes methods other than the scientific method of discerning which things are more true and which things are less true. But so it's, if it's not, if we say, well, science doesn't apply to that, that doesn't mean no criteria apply, but it means different things. And, um, you know, on, on Thursday I had a bunch of medical students, and one was just quite emotional, quite emotional saying, I can't put together my religious convictions and my scientific ones, and it's bothering me. I have tests next week, and this is really, really bothering me. So I said, well, first thing, you don't have to solve every problem now. Secondly, you need to live with, learn how to live with some uncertainty. But thirdly, you're at a place where a lot of people have walked through that doubt. We've been through that. 
We know what that means. And we came out on the other side of those fires okay. But what, what bothers me is those who want to be postmodern when they haven't been modern. One has no right to be postmodern unless one has been modern. And the essence of modernity will corrode your belief to a way that's frightening. Anybody who's gone on an advanced study in philosophy, theology, anything like that, knows the, the long night when you wonder what happened. But you work your way through it. Now, some people say, well, the way to handle that is just never go to a university. You know? Uh, the way to handle that is to go and always ask for more evidence and realize that what you did believe got you here this well. So don't, don't just abandon what's been so good to you so far, but be willing to change. And not everything you believe as a child is going to remain. Something will. But the point is, the scientific method uh, does what it does very well, but there are ranges of of experience that it is not appropriate. And I think that's a very good point. Somebody else? Uh, the, you, you said uh, different expressions a, a few times. You talked about the freedom in part, you know, and, and you talked about some capacity to choose, uh, some measure of, right? Um, <coughs> the, my question is, do you see the freedom to choose um, a release from the, the deterministic part or a constrained by that? And I think that's one of the th places where I think I sort of bump, you know, having my first and, and probably low level <laughs> training because I never did advanced degrees in theology, but been coming up to a minister and then going into a scientific world, you go, wow. Same, same uh, shaking of the foundation. Yeah, right. these these worlds speak with different words. Right. And uh, I mean, I appreciate what, what you're saying. So uh, so which, how do you do it? Is, is the freedom to choose, is it a release? You know, is it the thing that sort of uh, keeps the biology or whatever it is, uh, or the science uh, in, you know, check, or is it constrained by the, the, the reality of, of the biology and the, and the science, etc. How do you do it? Well, well let, me, let me try And I'm not sure, quite sure if I'm hearing the question correctly, but that which is the next occasion of freedom is the integration of everything that has happened up to now, along with some relevant possibility. So everything we know, everything uh, science can tell us is frozen to that experience. God's lure does not work against that. God's lure works with that and invites us to make a, a, a positive step, not a huge but a positive step in the right direction. I don't know if that's a way of getting to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, my fear is that a lot of people who believe in the supernatural actually mean contranatural. The word supernatural does not have the meaning in history that it has now. When people talk about the supernatural now, they, they talk as though they mean contranatural, such that the miracles, for instance, violated, violated the laws of nature. So that's, a, that's a definition of a miracle. It violates the law of nature. But I'm a traditional evidence on that. Ellen White says God never works against his principles of the universe. God works in, <coughs> with, so we don't have this idea of a God who just acts in a wholly discontinuous way with everything that has happened. Now, a person like Philip Clayton says there can be no, uh, no interruptions of any magnitude 
in the causal process at all. And I think Rick Rice disagreed with him on that. There are, there are moments, there are moments of, of great uh, significance in the history of the universe when God may participate in the process in ways that are not typical. But it's also always a matter of greater or lesser or this or that participation. It's never an intervention. It's never a contradiction. Uh, it's never a violation of the laws of the universe, providing we keep humble about the laws of the universe. We don't, we don't understand everything there is to be understood. I often think what George Washington would think if he saw you talking into a little box to your son in Australia. Mm. Perfectly natural, but for him it looked like some divine intervention. Yeah, and of course, what George Washington would think if he could see it, they are 15. But any, um, <laughs> you know, I like most of us, I, I, I didn't get through that two hour. I didn't either. Thing. But the Sabbath isn't over. Yeah, I know. But I did <laughs> find another one, very interesting, by a fellow by the name of Greg Caruso, two G's, called The Dark Side of Free Will. Okay. It's a TED Talk, it's not very long. Okay. But he does deal with this question. What about responsibility if we if we, we set aside free will? And I, I think it's really worth uh, looking at because uh, because he has some answers that I, that I think are, are very interesting. So I just recommend the Dark Side of Free Will by Greg Caruso. How long is it? It's, Ten minutes, maybe. Oh, I love those ten minute ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah ten minutes. Yeah, and he's, he's very articulate, and, and he has some very interesting ideas, uh, you know. Well, here's, here's one that I think is, is a good idea from the determinist. A person like me who is likely to say, well, if someone burns your house down, you're not going to just say, that's okay. Uh, you're going to say you shouldn't have done that. But that person comes back to me and says, well, I won't say that that's okay, but I will say I understand that there was something about your past that caused you to do this very good thing. So I'm not going to be fanciful. I'm going to try to help you have a different future. So the whole, the whole issue of blame uh, sort of melts away, and I, I find that very powerful. Well, that, that's what Carissa says. He, he said, we ought to think of the analogy of uh, a... Uh, a lethal and very infectious disease where we take the patient and put them in isolation. And we don't blame them for contracting this disease. They have nothing to do with it. And we treat them for the disease. So this arsonist that burned your house down, we just don't say, oh, well, if you're not responsible, go burn a bunch of more houses down. Yeah. We put this person in quarantine and we treat them for the, for the problem. The question I have is, what if he wants to put us in quarantine on the basis that we're the sick ones? You know, but having said that, I want to, I want to affirm the power and the moral attractiveness of that view. And I think that we attribute too uh, many uh, bad things to people as though they chose to be bad when they really did. Mm -hmm. They, many people don't have the choice, like you said to begin with, many people really don't have the choices that we've had. And it's very, that's something, see, I need, we, I think we need to sit down and listen to each other. We can learn that from that from the determinist. I think we're altogether too hard on each other. Altogether too hard on each other. We don't know. We don't know why we have to really do it. <coughs> Puck said something like that. There's a lot of debate about it. There's a great deal of debate about that. Uh, but something's going on there. Paul says in some way. I'm going to put Puck in myself. I'd like to go back to this question. <coughs> my, my short answer would be both. In other words, sometimes you've got to make when you make choices, you are selecting among options. And that means you are limiting yourself to the one you choose. But that may be the only way to a position where you have more choices. Um, I don't know how many 
professional programs people can realistically take. But I think if somebody says, I want to be a dentist, you're in the dental school, as I recall, right? Okay, I want to be a dentist, but then I can't, you know, play professional basketball or, or tennis <coughs> or probably become a physician, or maybe I can do that down the road. But, but you might say, well, okay, you're making a commitment here, but look at the options you get. You want to practice orthodontia? endodontia, periodontia, oral <coughs> surgery, and so on. So limiting options, or apparently limiting your options at one stage may be the only path there is to opening them another way. And I think in some ways, as we, as we go through life <laughs> and we make choices, we may say, oh, but look at all that I'm losing. Yeah, but look at all that I'm gaining. When my wife and I decided to get married, that ended our dating life as far as I know. <laughs> but we had the opportunity to, uh, to spend a life together in ways we never would have otherwise. Our son was content at one point, this will be just between us, uh, with, you know, a two-year degree will be all I need. We said, no, you're finishing, you're getting a bachelor's degree. And as it turned out, had he not gotten it, he would not have had the options that he was able to take advantage of later. So I think we, we sometimes think of choices as involving limitations when in fact they're the only route to further opportunities. Yeah, I like that a lot. Dr. Ratzinger. David, this is a marvelous time together and I want to thank you for opening doorways that are rarely explored by most of us, but you're dealing with, with Choices, the way we live, the way we think, the judgments we make. What you have very wisely kept away from is how physicists deal with the events in our brains. They know that electrons are passing between neuro nerve cells. And so it's, it's <coughs> particles. And so physicists for, for a generation have been trying to dig up the ultimate particles the Higgs particle, and so on. And just two weeks ago, if I may venture to, to introduce a new idea, I heard a lecture from the Cavendish Laboratories in Cambridge University, where some of the world's most uh, life-changing discoveries were announced in Cambridge University. And the, the lecture that I heard on uh, just a couple of weeks ago, given from the Cambridge Laboratory in Cambridge, was by a physicist named Dr. David Tong, actually. How do you spell that? David Tong, T-O-N-G. Okay. And uh, he was coming to the point of saying what we are now coming to is that, that all the, the effort we're putting to particle physics down to down to molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, quarks, and the rest of them, he said, even electrons, they do not exist as separate particles, but we have now come to the point where the whole of the universe is suffused by a medium to which years ago they called ether, but we're not using that term. And they say that the things we have been calling particles, now we are considering are simply fluctuations in this medium. And but I couldn't help but thinking, as I listened to this lecture, that my thinking, my thoughts, my, my choices, my guilt, everything else that we think of when we think of spiritual experience, is all based upon fluctuations in the medium. And physicists are trying, you see, to reduce our life and the thinking processes down to the very fundamental, most fundamental uh, events. The events that go well beneath what Alfred North Whitehead was talking about. Uh, the events, fluctuations in the <coughs> basic universal medium. I, I'm sorry this is, but physicists, they are the ultimate people who are in, insisting on determinism. 
And uh, so the next question which believing Christians should be asking is, through what mechanism and at what level of the, the physical nature of which our minds are composed, at what point does God intervene, the Holy Spirit affect those fluctuations in the ultimate media? I'm sorry, but we're getting into fields way beyond me. And most of it. But, but I think that's right on, right on target, because people like uh, Nancy Murphy and Philip Clayton and Alfred North Whitehead, uh, people like that say physics cannot answer everything. And the, 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 uh, uh, the assertion that everything can be reduced down to what physicists can study they are saying is false. So I would say, okay, physicists, get together with some psychologists. Because we can understand the human self only so well by going down, 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 down to quarks. Why don't we get the psychologists involved? And it's remarkable to me how little cross-disciplinary work is going on here. But people like Nancy Murphy that would say, okay, let's take it, take it for granted that you're right. And if we take the uh, implications of what you're saying seriously, that means we're all determined. Now explain to me how we have all these institutional, institutional patterns. So we have to start at the top and work down, as well as start at the bottom and work up. But that is exactly the issue at hand. Do the physicists have the moral right, the intellectual right, the scientific right to say they settle all questions of fact? That's the issue. And uh, some say, well, yeah, you know, everything reduces down mm -hmm. to physics. I am not persuaded of that. Mm -hmm. well, philosophers like to use the expression self referentially stultifying. And I was, that occurred to me when the, you know, the email you sent out, where the woman is put down and she says, I chose to come here. That's what I read this. And they said, no, you really didn't. It was determined by factors over which you had no control. You really understood the full nature of your physical makeup. You know you have no choice. Well, it seems to me she might have said, well, then your explanation of why I came here is the result of factors over which you have no control. <laughs> and so we're just, the two of us are just following, uh, yeah. uh, you know, deterministic accounts. So why should yours be superior to mine? That was a very uh, important moment in my life. I thought they were so disrespectful. Why don't we know this one? She was humiliated before that group of people who thought they knew what everyone would know if only they knew what they knew. But they're assuming that they're not susceptible to the exactly. same sort of exactly. explanation that they're attributing right. to her behavior. It, it is intellectually and uh, ethically uh, a problem. Thank you very much, David, <coughs> for your interesting presentation. Um, in the email that you sent, <coughs> you mentioned to me the schools of, of thought. <coughs> um, I believe that uh, they are supporting, most of them, they are supporting PACE. So they do not support PACE. But uh, I don't think they, <coughs> they are presenting God as the as, as the Bible is presenting. Okay. They, they think this in, in different ways. And you started your presentation with René Descartes. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that these schools of thought are also influenced by the Greek uh, philosophers. Okay. Okay. And I will start even from Heraclitus with his Pantare that everything in the universe is moving okay. and changing. Okay. And then going to Whitehead that uh, uh, believe that, of course, everything is moving in the universe, even God is, is moving and changing, and his knowledge even is, is increasing with the, I mean, the, what is happening in the universe. Also, uh, in the history of ideas, he had also uh, uh, this uh, thing that it's, it's very interesting, that we don't know all truth, we, we know only half truth. <laughs> And, uh, of course, this, uh, this is influencing our free will uh, very much, because if we know only half truth, then we have only half free will. 
Well, okay. I'm going to, I've been told that it's time to quit. Uh, uh, I, I want to hear more from you, uh, Peter, but also I want to invite those of you who are here to take the Atlantic article and read it because it's very, very interesting and very provocative on the very matters that Dr. Brandstater has brought to our attention, and rightly so. Okay, we don't have the, um, the <coughs> benediction states out, so um, let's pause for prayer. Dear God, thank you again. Sabbath. Help us to enjoy it. Yeah, Amen. Amen.